Uh, so as Justin was saying, this is sort of a group talk, general panel, uh, pretty free form. Uh, feel free to ask questions in chat as we go. Um, we, we're going to uh, hit a bunch of different topics. Now, the uh, title of this is, wow, that's really weird. Uh, one second. The, the, oh, that's right. We have, we have too many little pan uh, uh, things there. That makes more sense. Um, when we say agenda, what do we mean there? We're talking about anime that have some specific message they're trying to convey clearly with the uh, uh, anime that they're giving. So every piece of media, you know, is has some angle on things. You know, the creators have their pers their opinions. This is more than that. This is where an anime is clearly like trying to um, get across an opinion about something. I would say. Right. Um, it's uh, beyond the idea of uh, the hero's journey being mm -hmm. like the central theme to a show or anything like that. Uh, there, some shows are either subtly or explicitly trying to say something about uh, society, religion, technology, uh, environmentalism, uh, and they different different directors and different staff do that in different ways. And through some of these shows, you see it a little bit more overtly, mm -hmm. and uh, we're just really here to make a few suggestions based off the genre, based off uh, the themes of some of these shows, and also just based off our own personal preferences, talk about uh, the shows and the parts of the shows we like, yep. and why we feel they do such a good job with all that. Exactly. So let's go ahead and start with some pro-military anime. That being significant because Japan's military situation has been very unique for a very long time. Um, and let's start off with Gate. Um, so, how much have we seen of Gate? I've seen all of the first, I, I guess the first and only season, if I'm remembering okay. correctly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, cool. I've seen the first two episodes, okay. I think. Yeah, yeah it's a... Uh, this is this is definitely one of those where we feel the loss of half of our panelists. Uh, mm -hmm. Nate and Jay both have a extremely large uh, breadth of knowledge on Japanese military, mm. uh, going so far as to do panels on the military th itself. Yeah. Uh, but Gate is a uh, kind of uh, in that genre of shows where a specific type of otaku is really into their subject so they decide to put cute girls in there <laughs> and make everybody else interested in that subject as well mm -hmm. uh and this is a uh not quite an isekai a, mm, a gate opens up in the middle of tokyo the main character in the center there is uh you know goes into the other world but the gate remains open and it's not a one-time thing uh, it turns out that the Japanese military can go in, in and out freely from the gate into the other world, and the other world is completely outclassed by uh, modern-day military. Like, dragons pose no threat to them. Uh, any civilizations get, totally get dominated by the uh, tanks and guns and so on and so forth. So, ostensibly at first, it's kind of about how... Uh, how a much more powerful military uh, intrudes upon another world without doing a kind of manifest destiny thing <laughs> where they just take over completely like mm -hmm. the goal of the military is not to completely dominate the other world mm. uh, I think they're trying they're, they are very the author was very much trying to portray the military the Japanese military in a positive light and they did not want to say like, oh, well, the military will go in and dominate the entire mm -hmm. uh, fantasy world. But what does happen is that they do get very gung ho about the Japanese military. Uh, there's one episode where the main character and the girls are, of course, at a hot spring for <laughs> one reason or another. I don't remember the reason why, but because the and this is in the real world. So mm. the other world's military send spec ops units to mm. try and uh, kidnap the girls, I believe, oh, okay. to yeah. 
either get information about the other world out of them or so on and so forth because I think Japan has a monopoly on the gate at the moment. Okay, yeah. And what happens is is that the like one Japanese soldier fends off three different countries' spec ops, <laughs> uh, including America's. Wow. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's very much glorifying Japan's military mm. and uh, saying like we are the good guys mm. we we go in and we we do everything we can to make the lives of citizens better in this mm. other world like we're trying to teach them battle tactics we're trying to improve their infrastructure like we are doing everything good here we're defending mm. them and the evil other countries are trying to take it all away and mm. stop of us and Unfortunately, it does kind of devolve into that uh, military uh, propaganda mm. uh, akin to an American military film. Mm. And the more uh, casual viewers might just be continue watching because, like, the girls are cute. Uh, the voice <laughs> actor work was really good. Mm. And, yeah, I mean, fan service abound in the show. Mm. But it is... A, like it is such a powerful case of military propaganda that they mm. did use it for recruiting in Japan. Wow! There were posters of mm. the gate characters like saying like sign up for the JSDF. <laughs> now, how much would you say this work is kind of um, a sort of wish fulfillment on the part of the author? Like, how much does it feel like this is? If I were a soldier, this is how I would like my life to be kind of a thing i mean i think like any any journey into another world is kind of like that yeah like the, i i can't remember if the uh main character was or if the author sorry mm. was in the jsdf at some point i believe I think he, he was, was yeah. yeah and so i think it's very it's like half kind of wish fulfillment of like you know the main character is this morally Ooh, sorry morally correct person mm -hmm. and ends up with a harem of women uh, <laughs> because he's doing so much good mm -hmm. and in the meantime he's like sticking to the ideals of the JSDF and uh, I think it, it kind of just goes on like this I haven't read the light novel or the manga uh, that it is based off of mm. but I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if it continues along this path uh, for the remainder of the run okay yeah fair enough interesting um, all right, let us move on to Obsolete. Have we seen Obsolete? No, nope. okay, obsolete. skipping Obsolete. Uh, let's talk about Full Metal Panic, because that's something definitely I can talk about, mm -hmm. uh, if nothing else. Um, how much of Full Metal Panic have you seen? I think I've seen like a few episodes, a few episodes mm -hmm. of a few different seasons. Okay. I know I've definitely seen the, the Hot Springs episode of Roku. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I've seen like half of the first season, um, all of the second season, all the third season, and the beginning of the fourth season. Um, and I have much of the manga in the other room. Um, so Full Metal Panic is interesting because the um, it's dealing with the military in both positive and negative ways. Uh, the main character is a member of an elite kind of special forces unit that uses mecha. And in this world, mecha exists, but they are not... Um, uh, the dominant force of military the way it is in most mecha anime. Um, so, you know, tanks exist, other things exist. Also, without getting too much into spoilers, um, mecha technology and other technology in Full Metal Panic are, they are not supposed to be. Uh, there are specific individuals in that world that have some kind of, like, strange access to advanced technological concepts that they're, they kind of channel through themselves. So they can kind of just kind of sit there and then suddenly they are, you know, they can kind of auto-write um, advanced physics concepts and, and ideas for advanced technology that, that can be implemented, but no one should be able to know that in that world. And that's how Mecha come to be in all this advanced technology. The girl in this case, Chittery, is um, just such a, uh, a person, and so she's kind of a person of interest, um, and the main boy character Sosuke is a uh, special operative who is assigned to protect her and keep her from being essentially kidnapped by various foreign powers who might want her. Um, so on the one hand, it is um, 
it's interesting because the other thing is Sosuke is a former child soldier, very kind of badly abused by that situation, and so is the the drama and the comedy of it is that he has no sense of what normal human life is, and so he dramatically misunderstands common situations as having dramatic military uh, implications. And so he, you know, as soon as he's assigned to take care of the girl, he's like planting landmines around the school, stuff along those lines. So a lot of sort of comedic elements to it. Um, but it also deals with the fact that the organization they're part of has this very serious mission. And so especially as the story progresses, you get more and more things going on. I think the third season opens with them interrogating a prisoner and like they begin to break his fingers. Um, to get information out of him. And the, one of the other characters like clearly doesn't like this, but just kind of shrugs it off and keeps going because like that's what you have to do. So there's... Um, it presents kind of both sides of the, like, this is... It is good that we have these protectors because people need them, but also they are open to abuse. Uh, yeah, it's a... What Brian mentioned about the, the juxtaposition of the comedy and drama is... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... If anybody had any criticism of Full Metal Panic, it kind of feels like it flip flops yeah. uh, a lot of the time. Uh, it it is dealing with a set like criticism of a child soldier, uh, but it's also portraying all these situations in a purely comedic uh, yeah. route, where it's like you know you're supposed to be laughing at this, but under the surface is like, oh they like mind broke this kid so mm -hmm. bad that he has no idea what normal is. Yeah, uh, and the, the unfortunately the show like. It, you have to kind of go a layer deeper because the show mm. kind of just wants you to be like point and laugh at the yeah. funny situation. Uh, but in at least the main series seasons, they just takes a much more serious tone. Whereas like Fumofu is uh, Kyoani's attempt at just making everything like super duper wacky and funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Season one is, it, it definitely flip flops to your point. Season two is pretty much entirely comedy. It, it's not, like, um, completely screwball dumb comedy. Um, sorry, camera's getting a little weird here. Um, but it is definitely a comedy, first and foremost. Seasons three and four go back to the seriousness. So that, that is much more of a, here we're dealing with the, the strong implications of all this. Like, I would say season three is, there's not much comedy in season three. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is entirely, like, Sosuke dealing with his issues um, and um, Chittery being caught in the middle of all that. Uh, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's probably something along the lines of the author of evolution. Yeah. Uh, like, as a series goes on, uh, the author kind of just throws everything at the wall at the beginning yeah. to see what sticks, then exactly. eventually falls into the niche. Well, and also like he was like I, I he was writing the novels contemporaneously with all this coming out. Mm. So season one was we already have a good amount. I think Gonzo adapted that first season, and then it moved over to Kyoani back when Kyoani was on Ascendancy, um, but they were very much known more as for, for light comedies, so they were kind of, okay, let's do kind of a Haruhi kind of a thing with this, uh, or Lucky Star kind of thing with this, and then um, once they realized, oh, we have staff and, and folks that can actually craft a more serious story, I think they could go more in that direction, to your point. Was a, what were the later seasons adapted by? Um, Kyoani. They were all? I, I believe they were all Kyoani. Mm, okay. That I recall. Um, I know Fumofu was, but I'm not entirely yeah. sure what the other um, let me, I, I'm pretty sure, because I remember um, Goro, I forget his last name, the, the author of the Tommy original Kiyuchi. novels. Yeah, I th yeah. Um, he, he talked about how like he he stayed with KyoAni for a long time because he like had such good relationships with them. In fact, so funny story. Um, so the creator of Full Metal Panic also wrote an episode of Haruhi, an episode of Lucky yeah. Star. The episode of Haruhi <laughs> is the episode where they're playing the video game, um, and uh, right. you know, Yuki Nagato is doing the <laughs> on, the, on the keyboard. Uh, the episode of Lucky Star he wrote was the episode where they go to Kamaket, and they um, come across uh, hentai doujinshi of Full Metal Panic at Kamaket, and there's a whole sort of running gag about that because. Um, one of the girls uh, also reads Full Metal Panic. It's kind of a running gag in the show. The uh, so I just what I saw just now mm -hmm. is that uh, Kyoani did the second raid. Okay. But 
Gonzo did the movie. Okay. And then Zebek did uh, Invisible Victory. Okay, gotcha. Uh, um, because Kill Annie, a- after, I don't know, what is it, 20, probably 2012, 2013 mm. time frame, they really stopped doing other people's stuff. Yeah, like, true. They were like, we're going to do all of our own stuff in house now. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so final season was that. Um, cool. Okay, yeah. As Cornish Cream Tea's pu- putting in the, in the chat, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so that's Full Metal Panic. Definitely interesting. Also, one of those very anime kind of a things, if you will, where it's you know weird premise, goofy comedy, serious moments out of nowhere. You know, not the kind of thing you'd you'd easily see adapted to live action, for example, uh, over here. Please, whoever, don't try a Full Metal Panic Hollywood live action adaptation. That's not going to work. Thank you. No. Um, all right. Um, moving on to anime about the neat phenomenon, um, aka not in education, employment, or training. Right. I believe. Um, so these are f- so neats being folks who are not part of the workforce, basically, but adults um, or not homemakers, etc. And there's been some pushback on that in the last couple of decades. Um, I would say when the when the phenomenon first arose in like the 90s. Um, it was seen in the general Japanese public as something where it's like, that's unfortunate, but we understand that there are a few folks who can't you know, cope or who are in a situation, so fair enough. Then it became so widespread, and folks were like, whoa, you know, it, it, this is not good. Right. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, one of the NHK is kind of one of the canonical examples of that. Um, I have not seen much of this. I need to get back to this. Yeah, I haven't seen much either. Yeah. Uh, I think I read volume one when I was mm. in high school or so. Yeah. Uh, from from what I know and what I understand, though, you know, very half wish fulfillment, half dark comedy yeah. is uh, very much like a, a cute girl shows up and tries to save the main character from complete despair uh, in the lifestyle of being a neat. And the main character is into some extremely questionable stuff. <laughs> uh, it does go through some extremely heavy themes. Mm-hmm. Like, almost straight from the get-go, there are some uh, very heavy mental health things going on. But it is also kind of sort of portrayed as a, as a like dark slash black comedy. Mm-hmm. I don't know that it ever gets to the point where I would consider it a black comedy, but dark comedy for sure. Yeah, uh, And it is maybe a little bit uncomfortable to watch if any of the themes like hit close to home for you Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm sure even even though these are like supposed to be the gross losers who stay in their house house all day it is that same thing that anime does where they take aspects of real life and amp them up to 11 yep so I'm there are things that people can relate to whether it be you know not having many friends at a certain point in your life uh, staying in your room a lot being introverted Mm -hmm. uh you know, so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, but I don't, I can't talk to it in any real depth because mm-hmm. unfortunately I haven't read the whole thing or watched the whole thing. Yeah. Um, also interesting because one of the characters, uh, he connects with a uh, girl, young young woman, who uh, wants to fix him, right. so to speak. So she's interested in uh, saying, okay, well, we can we can resolve this issue. And so it's, also about that weird tension of somebody trying to change you. Do you want to change? It, is their motivation pure, right? You know, how, how much should somebody change somebody else? Those sorts of uh, 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 aspects as well. Right. It's a uh, kind of that thing of like, I think what's touched on is, is she doing this to save him or is she doing this to feel good about herself? Right. Uh, which is a question that gets brought up especially for uh, charitable enterprises a lot mm-hmm. uh, there is the there's a discussion often especially when now that we're in the realm of like internet charity and mm. people doing good acts for views <laughs> the, the idea is the, the question brought up is is any charitable act entirely selfless is, is selfless sure. is it possible to have an entirely entirely selfless charitable act mm-hmm. because the idea is is if you take any satisfaction at all in any way from doing the charity, mm-hmm. then it is not entirely selfless. Right. Like you, if you donate twenty dollars to a charity, you don't expect anything in return, but mm-hmm. you feel that makes you feel good about yourself, and mm-hmm. that means it is not selfless. Mm-hmm. So, uh, 
that question gets like lightly touched on, I believe, uh, from how the main girl is uh, acting in this scenario. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously the main character has to deal with the idea of like, you know, is she doing this to, to prank me? Is she doing this? That, like, why is she doing this for me mm-hmm. specifically? Yeah, exactly. Uh, interesting stuff. Um, all right, we on to Eden of the East. So this is interesting. So Eden of the East is not primarily about this, but it touches on this. Um, have you seen this? I, I've seen it in college a okay. long time ago. Yeah. Uh, from what I remember, I did not understand anything that happened. <laughs> <laughs> so Eden of the East is intended to be one of those shows that is, it, it, it starts very much in the moment, um, and you just kind of have to figure it out as best you can based on connecting together uh, various clues. Basically, the uh, black-haired boy here is brought into a, a game, one of these things where, you know, a dozen people all get a cell phone that they can use to kill anyone they want kind of a thing or call in any favor they want, and it just happens, and it'll all get narrowed down to one winner at the end, one of those kind of ridiculous game concepts. And then the girl gets uh, brought into all of that, just kind of accidentally uh, sucked into to the whole situation. Uh, notably, though, the boy um, has no memory. He's forgotten what's going on. Um, and so he's trying to figure it out at the same time, like, why do I have this? What, what, what does all this work? Why does people want to, want to kill me? Um, and one of the things he does is he, de- he decides to actually mobilize the homeless and the, the, the unhomed. So he realizes there are all of these people out there that are undocumented, that are kind of living in, in, in these various things, and realizes how powerful that is as a leverage point and a thing to use when you are in this sort of shadowy game uh, uh, involving all of that. And so then kind of opens up questions around how ethical it is <laughs> to kind of mobilize all these people and try to kind of uh, do that. And he, um, without getting into spoilers, he does have like, um, uh, there are things he's trying to do them, like to help them. It's not just like purely, you will help me solve the game and then you get thrown away. Um, but it is a fairly dark direction to take for that kind of a story. It is, uh, I guess, one topic that I don't know if we cover in this, mm. or we don't have, we, I can't, I, I can't remember all of our genres. Uh, it's definitely homeless population in general, though. Mm-hmm. There have been more anime in, uh, lately that have uh, dealt with homeless population. There's even the Yakuza series, especially, mm. deals with uh, uh, the oh, homeless yeah, that's population. Right. Yeah. yeah, the last two games especially have been pretty highly focused on homeless population. Mm. Uh, and then there have been a few shows, and like, one Alan like specifically called Hina Matsuri. That oh, takes yeah. a look at a. Uh, I didn't know that. I did that. Yeah, yeah. It, it takes a pretty. It, it's not the focus of the show, but it mm. incidentally does take a pretty serious look at the homeless population issues in Japan. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the, el- the only other thing I have to mention about Eden of the East is I am reading East of Eden right now. Ah. Nothing <laughs> like Eden of the yeah. East. <laughs> <laughs> don't, I, 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 I'm sure the connection is there somewhere, yeah. uh, but I don't, I don't see it right now. Mm-hmm. East of Eden is a very... Uh, different kind of story okay. than of the East. Interesting. Um, um, but, uh, I, I mean, Eden, Eden of the East does take a lot of Western inspiration, too. Sure. Uh, I can't, what does it say, like, why did we put it in the neat category? I think just because that was a subplot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm, well, and also because, frankly, there aren't a lot of anime that do touch on this topic. Mm. Like, it, it's, it's a, a somewhat taboo topic in Japan, uh, at least within anime. I think there have been some more in the last few years, mm-hmm. especially with yeah. uh, uh, isekai stuff. That you have characters mm-hmm. who are needs that get sucked into True. other world, other worldly situations. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I think we could definitely take a look at some of those in the future as well. Yeah, agreed. Um, so then, moving on to MMO Junkie. Yeah. Um, so this is a it's a fun one. Have you seen this one? No, okay. I think I saw one episode and I didn't follow up okay. on the rest. So I, I've seen this uh, uh, through. This was my kind of uh, uh, light, fun anime of that season. Where I was like, I'm just enjoying this. Uh, basically, the young lady there in the center with the long purple hair was a salary woman. Is that the term? I don't know. 
Um, and she basically worked a you know 80 hour a week job for forever. Uh, ended up leaving the company, and then is like, okay, I'm just gonna spend the next six months or whatever just doing nothing. Like I'll get a job eventually, but I just do not want to work at all for a while. And so she stays at home, uh, logs into an MMO, and uh, ends up reconnecting with a friend of hers and kind of starting a romance with uh, somebody that she got to know earlier in, uh, in a previous MMO. Uh, and kind of their, their romance evolves. But like, she is very much living the neat life in the sense that she has money, like she has savings she's living off of. Um, but other than that, she does not work, she does not want to work, she's not interested in that. Uh, and she's, but also kind of dealing with the burnout of a really hard job um, as kind of the reason for that. And so that was kind of interesting because, again, until a couple of years ago, you didn't really see the salary and exhaustion issue addressed in anime much. Um, uh, and so it was, it was refreshing to see that shown it very blatantly in this show, where it's like, yeah, you know, she just got worked to death to the point where she needs a like six month break from any kind of work. Um, so that, that was kind of remarkable. Uh, and the fact that the show unusually makes her the very uh, likable protagonist, right? It's not like, oh, you should be working. It's like, yeah, fair enough. Like, we, you know, we, we get it. So that was, that was unusual. Uh, it's the, the idea is what? That she's, like, the, the, the whole anti knee premise is that, like, it's not glorifying that she's in this position. It's like, well, she meets a guy, and it's like, well this is how you reconnect with society mm -hmm. uh, and you know it, it tries to bring them I forget it, it, how, what's the guy's situation of this? is he like a similar situation or is no he, he's a successful businessman yeah. um, but I, I, as I recall he is um, he's l losing satisfaction with his job in the sense that like it's gotten like oh okay I just do the job it's fine like but I, I don't get any joy out of it anymore um, and so he's not like burning out or anything. It's just, eh, I, I've gotten to a, a plateau in terms of, of my career. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, there's definitely, a, so thinking of that, there's like, there's other, there's probably other properties where you could look at like burnout mm -hmm. and jobs. And yeah. He like, needs, like, like even the Garden of Words, the teacher mm, in that. Yeah, uh, true. She's not, I mean, she's not a typical neat in the sense that like she's inside, she's not Hickok and Mori neat. Right. But she's, you know, skipping work and uh, feeling burnt out for yeah. a number of reasons. That's true. Uh, which also is a uh, kind of subtly implies that like the way to fix it is to uh, find something to uh, reignite your spark for your job. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Which is what ends up happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to remember, I, I don't remember how MMO Junkie ends from a career perspective i don't recall that she like ends by getting a new job or anything I, th I think she may like be i think at the end she's like okay it's time for me to start like job hunting again but i'm gonna you know do this more deliberately i'm gonna find something that i'm gonna you know i can i can enjoy more um so i think that's that it could be that like there's an opening at the guy's company something like that i don't i don't recall again um, again, interesting to see something that, that addresses that kind of directly. I could totally take six months off right now. Yeah, I, 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 totally. I totally hear that. Um, <laughs> wouldn't mind that. Um, okay, we definitely have time to get into disability slash aging. What surprises me is that that last section did not include the most obvious example of uh, we're talking about homelessness. Um, why didn't we talk about um, Tokyo Godfathers? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, Satoshi Kon is notably absent from this. Like, yeah. he has a lot to say about Otaku and mm -hmm. uh, Tokyo Godfather. I yeah. I haven't seen Tokyo Godfathers. That is definitely okay. something for. Yeah. Uh, Alan's a huge Satoshi Kon fan. Yeah, uh, and actually, there. Okay, it's, it's not neat. Uh, but there is a an obsessed Otaku in um, his TV series. Uh, Paranoid. Uh, Paranoid Agent. Agent. Yeah. yeah, and like, there's a whole episode about a a guy who is unhealthily obsessed with. Uh, that kind of stuff. And it's it's clearly like he's not anti otaku. It's just like they're, you know, pretty much every episode is about somebody who is unhealthily obsessed with something. Um, and so he's kind of, you know, the, the, the fan version of that. Um, but yeah, interesting. Um, all right, disability slash aging. 
Oh yeah, we can definitely talk about disability with interviews with Monster Girls because that is kind of the theme of this show. Mm-hmm. Um, you seen it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, there's a the, the perspective that I that was brought up by our co-panelist Alan mm. is that interviews with Monster Girls mm-hmm. is a parallel to how uh, people with disabilities uh, navigate life. Yeah. And the show is just at its core is monster girls have shown up in the real world and they are in very small numbers so there's not a lot understood about them and there's all different types of monster girls uh, the one on the left is a succubus uh the bottom left is a uh, uh yeah yeah and and the one on the bottom middle is a vampire the one in the middle upper middle is her sister who is not a vampire and the one on the bottom right is pretty obviously a dulahan Mm -hmm. and the teacher is the main character who is the guy in the lab coat and it is him uh understanding and learning about the the girls and their experiences Mm -hmm. and not it, it, it seems like the attitude up until the point of the show is like they just these monster girls have to adapt into society whereas the show is kind of saying no like somebody needs to understand where these girls are coming from and Mm. what their perspectives are Mm -hmm. and the idea is well the uh what's it called the stereotypes about some of these monsters Mm. are over exaggerated as Mm -hmm. they are in real life with some people with these kinds of disabilities Mm -hmm. where the vampire girl uh she can she can be out in the sun and if she is for too long, it just kind of makes her lightheaded. She's kind mm-hmm. of anemic. Yeah. Um, and she needs to feed on blood because she kind of has a light form of anemia. Mm-hmm. She's excused from gym class because she gets lightheaded outside. Uh, the Dulahan has uh, those kind, those similar kinds of disabilities to someone like somebody, maybe somebody missing a leg or somebody mm-hmm. who is uh, not able to uh, use all of their muscles properly. So, like he implements technologies to try and help her just navigate normal life like she has to hold her head all the time so he comes up he tries to give her a harness that holds her head uh so she has her use of her hands and it's also the kind of thing where like other girls are very uncomfortable talking to the dual han because they don't know whether they should acknowledge the fact that her head is detached (laughs) from her body and even though the dual han like uh like you know people with disabilities understand that they have disabilities right like the Dulahan makes the joke makes jokes several times about not having like the head mm-hmm. being disattached <laughs> not attached to the body and uh, you know beyond that it's kind of like an example of uh you know the flame coming from the Dulahan's head uh, does it connect is it a portal mm. uh, how does it work <laughs> and uh it is it, it is partially a commentary on uh that kind of minority experience yeah. uh even someone like the succubus teacher she has to dress very conservatively she has to mind herself around men because if she touches a man they you know lose control of all their urges Mm -hmm. and that can be a uh i i haven't i can't remember the argument for disabilities exactly but it's definitely an argument for minority experience and Mm -hmm. uh, how women uh an extreme example of how women are treated in male dominated societies Mm -hmm. where uh, you know, she has to be the one to control her her actions and her appearance right. and herself because men cannot control themselves around mm-hmm. her. And, uh, and a, a great example of that is with the protagonist, where whenever he's around her, he acts completely normally. Um, but then, like, you know, once he gets down the hall, he goes, Whew, you know, that was yeah. I, I, that that was intense. But it points out the fact that, like, the the you know, to the metaphor. Um, the fact that she's a succubus doesn't mean that men can't control themselves, right? And right. so it's kind of that, that that point that like, well, but you know, how how much is pe- is people is people um, reacting to her identity as opposed to the actual effects of her powers? Right. It's a it, it's to the point where it like grossly inconveniences her. To, yeah. Like she has to take the first train out in the morning because there's less people in the last mm-hmm. train home in the evening. Um, she has to live out in the boondocks because. Uh, she can't when she's asleep she can't control her powers as well and it affects greater area and uh the 
I think the the lightest example is the uh, Yuki Ona. Um, yeah. She just she just kind of doesn't understand what her powers do mm-hmm. or the extent of what she could potentially do. Mm-hmm. Like she thinks that she could bring a, a large amount of destruction to a lot of people because Yuki Ona uh, traditionally are you know temptresses that lure men out in the middle of winter and kill mm-hmm. them, and so because. Japanese students know that about Yukiona within the universe. They say like you need to stay away from her because she's she's yeah. going to you know trick you and try to uh, do something bad to you. And mm-hmm. that she's just a shy girl that you know the worst that happens is that she turns bath water cold. Or, yeah. like she cries <laughs> she she cries tears of ice, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's the extent of it. And it's not like she's so like it, it's it, it's a a good uh, show about taking small snippets of these different experiences and yeah. how uh, uh, the teacher tries to handle them and understand mm-hmm. them. Yeah. And it's also an interesting uh, example of kind of light world building where one of the things they, they suggest is that there were probably a handful of women with y- the Yuki Ona powers who were tempestuous, who tend to, pe- pe- tend to appeal to their death. And so they became what everybody thought that was. Right. right, and so in world, there's a reason for these stereotypes to exist, but re- you know, there's no actual connection between like villainy and the power. Um, very interesting. Um, moving on to Rojin Z, <laughs> boy. Speaking of, um, love that one. Yep, disabilities and aging. So this is a weird one. Um, this is about oh hi Chelsea. This is about uh, a high tech bed. Uh, basically, the idea is a uh, a a bed has been invented that oh uh, uh, do the thing. Uh, I keep waving my hands and it keeps thinking it wants to focus on me. The uh, a high tech bed has been invented for the the elderly and the infirm as something that can take care of them them more completely. So it can do automatic injections of medicine and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and it has this sort of biofeedback technology in it, so it will learn from the person what they need and, you know, uh, uh, um, respond appropriately. Well, they connect this to the first, like, actual person they want to do this with, and turns out what he really wants is to go home. So the bed proceeds to rip itself out of the hospital and, you know, go home and, like, add extra technology to it and kind of build to it and, and, and expand and so forth. Um, and so it becomes this sort of massively destructive vehicle, Mad Max style, uh, running through the city, just trying to get ready to get home, uh, as everyone's uh, trying to re- resolve that. So the uh, the screenshot is very representative of kind of the overall reaction of everyone to what's going on there. Um, but it is this interesting element of like this this old guy is just, you know. He's just existing, kind of living there in, you know, in his bed, but he still has desires. He still has a life. He still has things he wants to do that people are kind of ignoring for forever. Um, kind of a commentary on how uh, uh, those sorts of people tend to be pushed aside in society and uh, kind of ignored and how if, if given the opportunity, they would definitely do a lot more. Very interesting. Also by the creator of Akira. Yes. Uh, and it has that same, same kind of style and feel to it. So if you're looking for something... The author or the direct? Both. Yeah. Both. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah he wrote the yeah. manga and then directed the anime. Right. So... Yeah, that was... Uh, sorry, I'm off, off screen. That's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I really like this movie because it, it's... I mean, this is a little bit gross, but the, <laughs> the movie starts basically with the older gentleman at his home and he has a bell that he rings that mm-hmm. is connected to a phone that gets to the nurse. That's the girl in the sweater in the middle. Mm. And um, he messes himself. He soils okay. himself. Yeah. And so one of the things of this bed is that it does literally everything, including diapering you. Wow. And so it's supposed to be the ultimate in technology of taking care of old people. But it, it, he's not really enjoying it. Because yeah. when you watch it, it's just like this, this machine is just going... Ah, we're going to inject you. <clears throat> just like stabbing, you know, being very, very stabby. Yeah. And, you know, things like that. And it doesn't help that in its effort to try to please what his desire is, which mm-hmm. is to go home, it takes on the voice of his now deceased oh, wife. Wow. And so there's a lot of just like, 
what is what do old people really need? What do yeah. they really want? Mm-hmm. And, and are we really taking care of them? Yeah. And <clears throat> as it turns out, because this is the guy who did Accra, um, <clears throat> you know, there's that shadowy government agency <laughs> that says the the bed is working perfectly well now <laughs> for for military designs. And so you, know, you had a little bit of that, but yeah. this is just uh, I, I'm sorry, this is cut in there. Yeah, sure, but, please. Um, it, it, this is one of my one of my more favorite names. Yeah, it yeah. So, it sounds like there's yeah. a like, sl- some commentary on loss of agency too. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, because like the idea is that like uh, the younger generation is like we want to design a bed to help these people, but then it ends up just taking away every decision that these people mm-hmm. have to make. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I yep. think the idea, like, it sounds like the idea is that <clears throat> any, any older person that would be put into this would end up hating it because like mm-hmm. any choice they make entirely, like that is. A problem just in real life with older the older generations is like they get frustrated that they can't do things that they used mm-hmm. to be able to do and the answer is not always just to have someone do it for them right uh, sometimes it is about getting them to accept that they can't do those things anymore sure but uh, there there are other solutions other than you know having their life essentially be on autopilot mm-hmm. the entire time yeah exactly um, interesting stuff all right, uh, a silent voice. Obviously, talking more about disability than aging here, um, and this is definitely one of the one of the heavy hitters, um, dealing with a uh, young girl who is uh, who is deaf, and spoiler alert, and uh, the reaction of those around her. Because boy, um, so the basic premise of this is again, I will have to kind of explain all this, but this is kind of back of the DD stuff, um, is that. This girl was um, uh, in grade school. Uh, she has to go through a variety of different grade schools because people, kids, turns out, are not the most sensitive of people. And uh, so she gets bullied. Uh, the main character, the boy here, uh, was her bully in one of those classes. But the bullying then kind of came back. He realized the consequences of his bullying. And so the story is him trying to atone for that bullying uh, and the incredibly complicated nature of that desire. Meaning, is that is it possible to atone for that? What does it mean to do that to everyone involved? Um, how do you move forward with your life after having done terrible things that you can't take back. Um, and then what are the implications of that for everyone around you? One of the beautiful things about this film is that it's not just about, turn that off again. Um, it's not just about that. Um, you, you follow all these various characters, most of whom were part of that, that class, and you see all the different variations on what happened there. You know, was this person involved, was this person kind of tangentially involved, what does that mean? So there's a lot of subtlety to its portrayal of, of that. And then uh, the other layer is how there's a great line in the manga, which didn't make it into the anime, which is completely understandable, where they talk to the girl's mother. And the girl's mother is very kind of emotionally closed off and very harsh. And there's a line where she says, you have no idea what it's like having to constantly advocate for your daughter in a society where no one cares. And it very much deals with the fact, and again, this is something that you, you don't see too much of in a lot of things, is that there aren't a lot of accommodations for people with disabilities in Japan. Um, there, there are some, but people do not bend over backwards for, in general, for, for those who are different. And that, that is something that she's had to just constantly bash her head against that there's just there's no one's willing to kind of really do much of anything you see that a lot in uh, uh, in the grade school experience where the the teacher says you know introduce yourself and she's the one who says you know I'm deaf or shows that he's deaf and then he hands her a thing and that's it like he, he does nothing he, he he wants to do as little as possible to uh, interact with her that way and so that is kind of the the unfortunate thing whoops one second one second. Uh, slight issue here. There we go. Um, 
but yeah. So that is um, thoughts. Uh, yeah, it's a. I, I haven't done as much analysis on a silent voice, uh, but it is the the it most it, one of the most interesting things I heard about the accessibility of this movie is that because it was for it was focused on a deaf character, and obviously it is a movie that uses sound. Mm-hmm. They tried to uh, make it as accessible as possible to deaf audiences, mm-hmm. and one of the ways they did that is by using uh, uh, Tokyo Sign Language, or Japanese Sign Language, oh, JSL. Okay. Um, and one of the most interesting things I heard about that is that in Ogaki, in the Gifu Prefecture, which is where this is set, mm. the Japanese Sign Language has variations. Uh. But in the movie, they chose to use the mainstream JSL because uh. Uh, it is more accessible to a wider audience. Mm. So... Uh, it is an interesting juxtaposition that they did not accurately choose to represent the mm. sign language that these characters would be using, but they chose to make it as accessible as possible to a wider deaf audience. Yeah. Um, which, you know, a lot of research went into that, and, uh, you know, they could have just relied on subtitles, but they had to uh, put in a lot of effort into you know, animating the hand, or hand signs right. and making it as accurate as possible. Yep. Uh, to that point, something to bring up. Um, this is, as far as I know, the second anime ever to actually have a a deaf character who signs in the anime. Um, and in the first anime they did that was called Girl Power. Um, they talked to the director, and the director said, "It's expensive. Like it's time consuming. Yeah. Like you got you got to tell the animator. Like it it's, adds a lot to the production process to be able to actually animate signing properly." And so just nobody does it. He said, it's not the, and he said, I've been working in this industry for, for a while. It's not that we don't want to feature that. It's just, it's an extra element that just adds a lot of complexity that no one kind of really wants to take on. Right. And I think, you know, it's a movie, a movie produced by Kyoto Animation is one of the better places to yep. do it. They have the power, they have the funds. I mean, this was, this was Naoko Yamada, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, she is so. definitely definitely a director who uh, was able to tackle this with the uh, the appropriate level of uh, seriousness. Yeah. Oh. What's interesting um, <coughs> is that the English dub, mm-hmm. the voice actress who yeah, the voice actress who uh, did the role is actually deaf. Mm-hmm. So when you hear her voice, that's actually her voice. That's not that's not made up that's, that's so cool a, that's, yeah. that, that's, a, that's a, a, actually who she is and it's an important plot point because um, in, like in the scenes where she tries to, to speak to, so she, she normally doesn't speak much um, especially as a kid and relies kind of on, on, on writing and such and then when she actually does try to speak the main character can't understand her because of the way she speaks so that is actually a plot point yeah. and by having somebody you know you realize it's not that what you are hearing is not somebody affecting that. That is literally what somebody with that sounds like, which really makes it m- much more impactful. So, um, and yeah, a sign of affection from this year was, was is an anime that, that deals with this as well. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, um, which is uh, sign of affection. I've seen a couple of episodes of that. That is more of a just straight romance anime, um, but where the main uh, one of the main characters is deaf, uh, which is very interesting. Um, all right, Jose the Tiger and the Fish. I have not seen this. Have you seen this? Nope. nope. We're going to have to skip this one. Um, I forget what the... Oh, yeah, she's in a wheelchair. Um, so that is kind of the, the big the big deal with that one. Um, but we're about at time, so I think this is a great time to uh, uh, pause with our Anime with Agendas talk. 